ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته before we start today's class, I just want to remind brothers that this type of class, this particular class, is of great importance. Learning about the Prophet uh, as a Muslim, our role model is and will always be the Prophet So because of that, learning about his life, how he lived it, how he interacted with others, uh, the sunnah that he left behind. It is a very important lesson for each and every Muslim, both uh, male and female. Because of that, I want to request from brothers and sisters to try to think of uh, good ways of uh, bringing more people to these type of classes. So I want everyone to think for themselves of uh, you know good ways of inviting people the more people we invite to these type of classes the more people benefit and the prophet sallallahu said uh, that the one that guides people towards good shows them good he is and he is like the one that did it even though you might not be here but if you advise someone else to come and benefit from the class then inshallah there's going to be a reward for you. So please, brothers and sisters, try to act, actively think of ways that we can encourage more people. Alhamdulillah, the amount of people that regularly come to these classes, it makes me very happy. And the more people benefit, uh, the better it is. Now, last week, uh, because of the fundraiser and the activities that we had, uh, there were no classes, so this week, inshallah, we'll do just a quick recap of what we said the week previous. So, we were talking about uh, the Prophet وسلم, calling the early uh, the Muslimin, those that accepted the call of the Prophet وسلم, in that early stage. Um, and we mentioned about the support that his uncle Abu Talib uh, gave to the Prophet And in today's class we will carry on with that uh, bit of the story. So Abu Talib, even though the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people who follow the Quran and the Sunnah, the way that the companions of the Prophet understood it, uh, they believed that Abu Talib did not accept Islam. He did not accept Islam and he passed away as a disbeliever. However, the support that Abu Talib gave to the Prophet وسلم, was tremendous, was enormous. And he would support the Prophet وسلم, to the best of his ability. Uh, but what happened was the Quraysh they tried their very best to even influence Abu Talib. So they would come to Abu Talib time and time again and they would tell him, you know, sort your nephew out, uh, talk to him, the way he's speaking, the message that he's trying to convince people of, it goes against our beliefs, it goes against our, uh, he's talking bad about our forefathers. So you're the closest person to him, you're the one that he will listen to, Please try to advise him. And Abu Talib, he tried to convince the Prophet He actually went to the Prophet on more than one occasion and he told him, he said, if you want uh, uh, this situation, the difficulties that you're facing, if you want it to go away, it is simple. Just leave what you're telling the people. Stop talking the way you talk and things will go back to normal the way that they always have been. And when the Prophet 
heard this type of speech from his uh, beloved uncle, he said a very beautiful statement. He said, Ya Am, لو أضيعت الشمس في يميني والقمر في يساري ما تركت هذا الأمر. Meaning, O oh my uncle, if the sun was placed in my right hand, if the sun was placed in my right hand, and the moon was placed in my left hand, I would never have left this uh, thing that I'm doing, this da'wah that I'm calling people towards. And this is a very eloquent way of saying that even if people gave me whatever they have in the world, they made me a king. If they gave me all the women that they have, if they did every single thing except to accept Islam, then I would not have accepted it from them. So this shows how dedicated the Prophet وسلم, was uh, to this cause, Islam. And then, once Abu Talib really understood how dedicated the Prophet وسلم, was, he started backing up and he stopped, stopped uh, advising the Prophet وسلم, in that manner and he actually uh, took a firm stance with the Quraysh. However, that didn't mean that the troubles that the Prophet ﷺ faced from the Quraysh stopped. Uh, we mentioned in the previous class that uh, people like uh, Abu Jahl would follow the Prophet ﷺ. And there's actually narrations that say that in the early stages of Islam, wherever the Prophet ﷺ would go, Abu Jahl would be there with the Prophet وسلم, taking uh, dust and uh, turab, sand, and uh, throwing it on the Prophet وسلم. And whenever the Prophet وسلم, would speak, uh, Abu Jahl would be there to say to the people, don't listen to this man, this man is a madman. So this is how things started to escalate and escalate and it became worse and worse for the Prophet And the Quraysh, they would make fun of the Prophet at every single moment, every chance they got. And they would ask the Prophet for miracles, even though they even though the Prophet وسلم, from time to time would show them miracles, they would make it a point to ask him specific miracles and they would say, if you don't do this, then we don't believe in you. If you don't do this, we don't believe in you. So the Prophet وسلم, some of the miracles that he showed them was when they actually asked uh, for him to split the moon in two parts, the qama, the moon in two parts. <coughs> the Prophet وسلم, did that through the uh, help of Allah Azza wa Jal. And when they saw this, this great miracle in front of them, and it's mentioned in the Quran, a whole chapter is dedicated, it's named after uh, the splitting of the uh, moon. When they saw this, they said, this is sikr, this is just some magic that uh, the uh, Prophet وسلم, is tricking people with. And this is the way that uh, not only the Quraysh, the people before always used to do. Whenever a messenger comes and he shows them miracle after miracle, the, uh, the first thing uh, that they would reply with is, this is magic, this is, you know, something, uh, a trick. Uh, Allah Azza wa says uh, more than once in the Quran, and if they see a portion of the heaven, the sky falling down, uh, they would say, uh, it's just clouds, it's just an illusion, it's something that uh, it's, uh, it is not what it appears to be. So they would always try to come up with these type of uh, excuses. And the Quraysh were no different, the Quraysh were no different. But they took it a step further. They took it a step further and they actually went to Medina. <coughs> and this is uh, at the time when uh, the Mushrikeen are in Mecca. They went as far as to Medina to try to find a way to silence the Prophet 
So what did they do? They went to Medina and they asked the, uh, the Jewish community in Medina, the big rabbis there, and they said to them, uh, this is this man in Mecca, and he is telling us he is a prophet. What should we do about him? And these rabbis said to the, uh, the mushrikeen in Mecca, they said, ask him about a few things. Specifically, ask him about three things. If he answers these three things, then he is a prophet. But if he fails, then he will be. we know that he is not a prophet. So what are these three things that they asked? We've covered this before in our tafsir of Surah al kahf The three things that they asked was, they said, ask him about the story of the young men who sought refuge in the cave. The story of Ashab al -Kahf. And then they said, ask him about Dhul uh, Qarnayn, this just king. Who was he and what was his story? And they said, finally, ask him about the ruh, the soul. What does he know about the soul? And the Prophet Sallallahu through wahi, through revelation from Allah answered all these questions. But even then, they would not believe. Even then, they would not believe. And from amongst all the people that uh, made life difficult for the Prophet Sallallahu and the early companions, there were some that stood out from the rest. One of them, without any shock or uh, it's not uh, news to anyone, is obviously Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl took it upon himself to make it his aim in life to go against the Prophet ﷺ every single chance he got. And he wasn't alone. There were other people that would take the same stance uh, Abu Lahab was another one. People sometimes they confuse Abu Jahal with Abu Lahab. But Abu Lahab and Abu Jahal are two different individuals. Abu Lahab is the uncle of the Prophet Abu Jahal is not. So Abu Lahab is the uncle of the Prophet So when he is making life difficult for the Prophet one can just imagine how that must feel when someone far away from you causes you harm it's not as harmful as when someone close to you, your own brother, your own sister, your own uncle uh, you know, does the same thing that's why we say uh, the term backstabbing comes from when someone stabs you in the back it's someone that you didn't expect it from you thought that this person would have your back, this person would uh, think good of you and try their best to protect you. So when someone backstabs you the way that Abu Lahab did to the Prophet وسلم, his harm is felt even more. And this is one of the reasons scholars in Islam, they say that Allah mentioned this man uh, in the Quran, in that famous surah, Surah Masr, where Allah Azza wa Jal says, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. And this is a curse, and subhanAllah, it shows the scholars in Islam, they say, this surah shows how truthful the Quran is. How, how is that possible? In what way? This surah, Tabbat, was revealed <coughs> during the lifetime of Abu Lahab. And Allah Azza wa Jal is mentioning in that surah, while Abu Lahab is still breathing and living, saying that this man is going to end up in the hellfire. If this man wanted to, if the Quran was not correct, this man could have accepted Islam, could have said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, and become a Muslim. But because Allah is Al Alim and Al Hakim, He knows what will come to be. Even whilst this man is still alive before he dies, Allah is telling us in the Quran 
this man would be in the hellfire. And obviously nothing changed. Abu Lahab carried on the same way and he passed away as a non-Muslim and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, gave that man what he promised. Another man that is of importance is a man by the name Uqba bin Abi Mu'id and this man you might have not heard of his name, but you might have heard of his actions against the Prophet He was the man that put the intestines of a, a, a camel on top of the Prophet whilst the Prophet was praying uh, uh, at the Kaaba. So this shows subhanAllah to what extent this Hard, hardship and this, these difficulties uh, the Prophet ﷺ had to go through. So this man took the insides, the stomach of a camel and he placed it while the Prophet ﷺ was in sujood, he placed that whole thing on top of the Prophet ﷺ, trying to make fun of him. And in another narration it says that once the Prophet ﷺ was praying, this man came up from behind the Prophet ﷺ and he tried to strangle the Prophet ﷺ. And he strangled the Prophet ﷺ so harsh, Abu Bakr happened to be nearby and he came up and he pushed the man to the side and that was how the Prophet ﷺ was saved. Uh,